Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Christopher Thomas Knight, who is also known as the North Pond Hermit? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, then I'll offer my analysis. Christopher Knight was born on December 7, 1965. He was raised in Albion, Maine. He went by the name Chris. He grew up in a two-story colonial that sat on 55 acres. He had four older brothers and one younger sister. The next-door neighbor of the family said that they had not exchanged more than a word with Chris's mother in 14 years of living there. It appears as though the family mostly kept to themselves. Chris described his parents as good. He had no complaints. He said they were not emotionally bleeding all over each other, not touchy-feely. Stoicism was expected. Chris did well in high school. He graduated in 1984, which was earlier than expected. He wasn't too popular there. He had zero friends in school. Chris enrolled in an electronics course at a technical school in Massachusetts. He found work installing alarm systems in houses and vehicles. In 1985, he bought a new Subaru Brat. One of his brothers co-signed the loan. Chris quit his job in the summer of 1986 and drove down to Florida. He then drove back to his hometown, but never stopped. He just kept driving north. He reached the edge of Moosehead Lake and drove until his vehicle was almost out of fuel. He parked the Subaru, put the keys in the center console, and exited the vehicle. He was going to live on his own in the wilderness. Chris really didn't have a plan. He wasn't even carrying a map. He only had a backpack and a few other items. Interestingly, his parents never reported him missing to the police, so it's not like anybody was looking for him. Chris camped in the wilderness and kept hiking south. Eventually, he didn't even know where he was. He developed a few tactics in order to eat. He foraged for food. He ate partridges that had been killed by vehicles, so roadkill. For comparison, this is almost as bad as eating at Arby's. Chris started stealing potatoes and corn from people's gardens, but he wanted more than vegetables. Chris had to wrestle with his conscience. He didn't feel good about stealing, and it frightened him, but he also liked to eat and didn't want to have to return to civilization. Chris started breaking into houses and other structures. He worked diligently to avoid people. He would check to make sure the structure was empty before burglarizing it. He realized that if he was to be arrested, his wilderness adventure would come to a conclusion. In addition to being careful about being caught in a burglary, he was careful about drawing any type of attention to himself. He set up his camp on private property in the area of Belgrade Lakes. His camp was well disguised, surrounded by several boulders. It was protected by the shade of trees. He spray-painted some of the items to look like the forest. He only had one tent, which he covered with multiple brown tarps. He was careful not to set fires that could generate a lot of smoke. He mostly used propane. Chris had collected quite a few propane cylinders. He may have had several hundred at his camp. He would cut his hair and shave, in part because he worried that if other people saw him with long hair, they might become suspicious and investigate. Chris said he never used a shower, a toilet, or slept inside a structure. He did use microwave ovens from time to time during the commission of burglaries. Maine winters are fairly brutal. On occasion, the temperature would drop below negative 20. Chris claimed that he survived the brutally cold winters in his camp by waking up during the coldest part of the night and pacing around his camp to avoid freezing to death. Chris continued to commit burglaries to maintain his isolated lifestyle. Typically, he would enter a building at 1 or 2 in the morning, raid the cabinets and the refrigerator, and quickly exit. He had stolen a wide variety of items over the years, just to name a few. Clothing, spices, radios, earphones, handheld video games, books, magazines, hand sanitizer, toilet paper, deodorant, razors, batteries, watches, pillows, flashlights, tape, propane tanks, laundry detergent, mouse traps, and paint. He also took a lot of food, like peanut butter, honey, tuna fish, hamburgers, bacon, bread, cereal, 
potato chips, coffee, pudding, Cool Whip, Cheetos, Devil Dogs, and Marshmallow Fluff. By the time his adventure was over, his teeth were not in good shape. Chris used the same pair of glasses that he had when he started his adventure. He tried on many other glasses during burglaries, but could never find a better pair. Chris was committing somewhere around 40 burglaries every year. At first, a number of his victims didn't realize what happened. They noticed that items were missing from cabins and other places. They might see scratches on the door frames, but it wasn't necessarily clear that there had been a burglary. Over time, they realized there was a serial burglar. People in the area were becoming frustrated and frightened. They felt terrorized by the constant threat of a mysterious burglar, who they referred to as the North Pond Hermit. Some people thought that the burglar was not a hermit at all, rather one of their neighbors. People upgraded door and window locks, installed surveillance cameras and alarm systems. They were desperate to protect their property and bring the burglar to justice. Some people left notes on their doors for the burglar, saying something to the effect of, don't break in, just tell us what you need, and we'll leave it out for you. Chris Knight's luck would run out on April 4, 2013, after being alone for 27 years. Chris decided to burglarize the Pine Tree Camp in Rome, Maine. This was not his first time burglarizing this place. On a prior occasion, he had stolen a key to a walk-in freezer. Chris set off a motion detector, which sounded an alarm. A game warden who was highly interested in catching the North Pond Hermit responded to the area. He only lived about a mile away. He had practiced this journey many times. He would leave his equipment in a place where he could get it easily, put it on, and race to the site. After arriving and looking through the window, the game warden spotted Chris Knight. He called for backup, but Chris started moving toward the exit, so the game warden had to confront him alone. He pointed his 357 Magnum at Chris Knight and ordered him to the ground. Chris surrendered without incident. He was arrested at 1.30 a.m. and taken to jail. Chris admitted that everything he had on him at that point was stolen except for his eyeglasses. He had committed over a thousand burglaries. He may have broken into the Pine Tree Ranch as many as 100 times. He only targeted structures that did not serve as anyone's primary residence. He was facing 10 years in prison for every single offense he committed. Chris pleaded guilty to 13 counts of burglary and theft on October 28, 2013. He was sentenced to seven months in jail, so he had one week more to go in jail at the time he was sentenced. The prosecutor said that a long prison sentence would have been cruel. In addition to jail time, there were a few other requirements as part of his sentence. Chris had to serve three years of probation, had to pay $2,000 in restitution, and complete a program designed for people who had both mental health and substance use disorders. He would end up living with his mother. Chris's brother ran a scrap metal recycling business. He gave Chris a job disassembling old automobile and tractor engines. It paid just room and board, but it satisfied his employment requirement for the court. Now moving to my analysis. The story of Christopher Knight elicits a variety of responses. Some people look at him as a hero of the wilderness, a person who triumphantly detached from society and lived alone for years. Others look at him as a fraud, someone who survived by stealing and may have lied about his survival skills. Many people simply don't believe he could have survived the winters in Maine on his own in a tent. They believe he had help of some sort or may have spent the winters in cabins which are unoccupied. Christopher Knight had an unusual personality and, of course, unconventional behavior. When he was in school, he was described as socially awkward and an outsider. In jail, he was diagnosed with Asperger's, which is now referred to as Autism Spectrum Disorder, he said he would become emotionally overwhelmed at unexpected times when he was in jail, like when he was watching a television commercial. Chris insisted that he may have been a burglar, a very efficient burglar at that, but he was not a liar. He maintained that all the stories of survival were true. Chris Knight's isolation in the wilderness was profound. Chris claimed that during his 27 years out there, he only said the word hi one time to a hiker that he unexpectedly encountered. So that one word was the only thing he ever said to anybody. Later, there was a report that he actually ran into fishermen in February of 2013 
and spoke to them. He told them he wanted to be left alone, and they promised him they would keep the encounter a secret. Chris really didn't seem to understand why he went out into the wilderness, other than he was never happy around people. This is a radical step, even for someone who really wants to be alone, as is repeatedly committing felonies. He read a lot of books and magazines when he was out there. He listened to Rush Limbaugh on the radio. He knew who the Kardashians were and even watched a little bit of television. Yet he claimed he didn't know exactly where he was or the decade. Learning about the Kardashians is quite disorienting for anybody, but I find it hard to believe he didn't know what decade it was. Chris claimed that he had never been sick, and other than his bruises taking longer to heal as he aged, he was doing fine physically. Relationships were not important to Chris at all. I find it interesting that his family never bothered to call the police and report him missing. Perhaps this says something about his early influences and how his personality formed. There doesn't seem to be any concern about solitude. There actually seems to be a preference toward being alone. Here's what I think happened with Christopher Knight. This is just my opinion. I think that Chris was tired of interacting with people and just became overwhelmed. That's why he left in such a hurry. Even though he did have a tent with him, he had never spent the night in a tent before. He was determined not to go back to society, but by his own admission, too lazy to live off the land. So he started stealing. Perhaps he thought he could just steal a little bit and be okay, but that wasn't working. If he wanted to survive out there for a long time, he would need to consume quite a bit. He would burglarize in such a way to facilitate his ability to rationalize his behavior. He would only do minimal damage to the structures. Sometimes he would even try to repair some of the damage on his way out, like he would try to re-secure the building. He claimed he only stole what he needed, although the police found $395 on his person, and of course he took a number of recreational items during his criminal career, like video games and magazines. I think that Chris wanted to believe he really wasn't a criminal. Other people owed him property because he was just trying to mind his own business. This brings me to the next question. Was his sentence fair? This is another area where there is a lot of disagreement. Some people believe that he should have been given cash and set free immediately, like people should have thrown him a parade. Others would have been okay with him serving something like 20 or 30 years in prison. Here we see a debate between mercy and justice. Looking at the mercy side, there is this idea that Chris was some type of hero of solitude, someone who threw off the expectations of society and made his own way. People should just leave Chris alone. What good is it to put him in prison? On the justice side, Chris terrorized the community for 27 years. Some residents were scared to go hiking. They did not feel safe anywhere in the area. Even though Chris's restitution was only $2,000, that was based on his 13 convictions. The total financial damage to the community was probably much higher. Even if he only averaged $500 in theft and damage each burglary, that adds up to half a million dollars. That doesn't even include money spent on security systems. As I mentioned, he may have burglarized the Pine Tree Camp about a hundred times. This was a non-profit camp for children with disabilities, which was totally dependent on donations. It wasn't like Chris was stealing from the rich. He was taking from those most in need, the most vulnerable in society. Chris was an exceptional burglar. He dedicated a lot of effort to his craft. He wasn't casually stumbling about just taking trinkets off of people's nightstands. He would sometimes watch their houses for days. He would break in when he knew the refrigerator was fully stocked. My opinion is that Chris deserved a harsher punishment than seven months in jail. I think the court romanticized this case and viewed Chris as a socially awkward loner who was not really trying to do any harm. Perhaps he reminded them of somebody like Chris McCandless, the young man who journeyed into the Alaskan wilderness and died alone. Christopher Knight was completely different than Chris McCandless. He lived a lifestyle at the expense of innocent people, whereas McCandless didn't hurt anybody else. Chris knew that what he was doing was wrong and continued to do it for 27 years. I think a sentence of three years in prison would have been much more reasonable. Now moving to my final thoughts. Christopher Knight was self-centered, arrogant, and had a sense of entitlement. He claimed he wanted to be alone, yet he continually interacted with the community. 
not so much with words, but with his crimes. Either way, he was connected. Specifically, he was dependent on stealing. The hard work of other people made his life easier. He was no hero of the wilderness. He wasn't a legendary and wise hermit. I think many people wanted to see meaning in his behavior that simply wasn't there. His story was fascinating and to some appeared to provide inspiration. But all Christopher Knight really did was disseminate fear and deprivation to innocent victims. Those are my thoughts on the case of Christopher Thomas Knight. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.